Um, just waiting to uh, connect the laptop to the uh, to the screen. Um, it may take a minute or two, but I can I can get going. Um, so I'm going to talk about my project called Axel, which has been on GitHub uh, since sometime in early 2011. Uh, it published a, uh, artifacts to Sonotype, I think, about two and a half years ago. Um, the main the main goal of the project, the, the in priority order, are to have a diverse set of algorithms that cover a lot of different domains. So examples are bioinformatics, natural language processing, machine learning, um, and then to be able to run those things on a diverse number of platforms. So of course, it has to run on the JVM being written in Scala, but I'd like to be able to run these things on Spark, on GPUs someday, um, on different linear algebra libraries. Um, that's what I mean by, by platform. Right. Um, and then uh, the, next, the next goal is to have these things really well documented. I think this has been discussed a lot in the Scala community, especially in the last year. Um, the, the, the way I'm approaching that is I've got a hand-rolled documentation tool, and I publish those examples to axel-lang.org. And the, the idea is that every code snippet you can take and cut and paste into a REPL, and it should work. Um, sorry, I guess there's a few more goals here. Of course, we want it to be correct. Um, the code coverage is still ongoing. Um, a little more work to do there. And then th these next three are definitely haven't really gotten um, to those just yet. I mean, the stuff that's documented is complete and works, but there's a lot of code in there that's sort of partially implemented. Um, a lot of triple question marks. Um, for the most part, I'm, I'm counting on the platform to give me uh, uh, speed. And then I want to supply enough sample data sets in the project to uh, to make the, the examples work. So an example of that is the irises data set that gets used for, for clustering algorithms. Um, just to get this out of the way, there's, uh, there's also some visualizations. They work well enough to sort of help me write the rest of the code that I'm working on. Those have been around for a few years. Uh, initially, they were all for Java AWT. Um, a couple months ago, I added some SVG visualizations. Uh, here we just have a time series of some ra random data. Um, so I've got way more content than I can cover, but I'm hoping to at least sort of give one story here in the first 10 minutes. And that is sort of the, the relationship between property-based testing and precision. Um, and this is the old Rhesus uh, peanut butter cup commercial, two great tastes that taste great together. Um, the commercial is even more ridiculous than I remember. Uh, these two guys, are, these two people are walking around on the sidewalk with headphones on. They bump into each other. One is, for some reason, eating a, a tub of peanut butter. Uh, and the other is eating some chocolate, and they, they invent a new, a new candy. Um, so it's about um, precision and, and the JVM. We've, we've all been in this situation. Um, add point 0.1 to point 0.1, we get point 0.2. Add another one, and we get this, uh, this imprecision. Um, we've we learned this early on in our, in our careers. We know how to deal with it. Uh, but I just want to remind people how, how jarring this is for new programmers to encounter. Um, that you have to explain this kind of stuff, that there are 11 bits uh, for an exponent and 52 for the mantissa, and then maybe you have to start talking about an arithmetic logic unit. And it really, the, the wheels come off pretty quickly. Um, so it would be, be nice to avoid that. Uh, so I'm going to give an example here of, of a metric space. So this project Axel is, is built uh, on Spire. Um, I, I went to a couple talks at any Scala two and a half years ago where, where Eric and Tom were introducing the project and it just uh, caught, caught my imagination. I said this, you know, I really want to spend some time uh, experimenting with what it's like to build software on top of this thing. Um, so this is a metric space. A metric space is one of the many type classes provided by Spire. Um, and this is just the definition from Wikipedia. So there are a few axioms, uh, there are four axioms on Wikipedia um, that define the metric space behavior. It turns out the first one can be deduced from the, from the last three. And those are um, identity. So if the distance between any two points is zero, then those two points must be the same point, uh, and, and vice versa. And symmetry, so point from A to B, the distance is the same as from B to A. And then we have the triangle inequality. So go, the, the, going through a detour can only increase uh, the distance between two points. Um, and uh, it turns out those, are, those, are tr those appear um, in, in a very similar form in the metric space laws in Spire. So that's the sort of comforting to know uh, that we can translate between this mathematical notation and, and these uh, Scala check properties. 
And uh, typically we think of, like the, the first example of a metric space we think of is points on the real plane. Um, and this is, again, just from a Wikipedia illustration of the triangle inequality. Uh, but we can, th the metric spaces exist for, for other kinds of types. Um, so an example is the, the Levenstein edit distance, which is a string metric. So you can, um, th this is two examples, one of uh, the, the distance between kitten and sitting, and the, and the other example is the distance between Saturday and Sunday. And you can see in both cases, if you read the number on the bottom right, uh, it's three, meaning that there are three edits required to go from one word to the other in both of these cases. Uh, and the, the way this is a dynamic program, you sort of, the, the algorithm starts at the upper left and it fills in to the lower right, and the, the number at the lower right is the answer. Um, so you can actually write that as a distance, um, as, a, as a metric space, uh, and you can use some of Spire's um, syntactic sugar to get this infix distance operator. So we can say the distance between the quick brown fox and the quick brown fax with a missing C is two edits. Um, and we can test it as such. So we can throw a bunch of random strings and, and see that all three of these axioms hold. Uh, now, random strings may not be the best input. Um, they're not, not going to be representative of the kinds of things that you're going to be measuring distances from, so that's a possible improvement. But it's at least nice to know that this passes. So a, a newer example that I've played with is uh, geo-coordinates. So um, here I show, that I'll show a metric space on this, but there's also here I'm showing that a geo-coordinates is basically a, a pair, uh, a latitude and a longitude. And each of those things um, is, is an angle, has to be an angle. So this thing called the unit, unit quantity, which is just a case class, enforces that anything you pass to it must be an angle. So it, it can be a degree, it can be a radian, it doesn't matter, it'll work, but you can't pass to it a distance or a time. So that you get that kind of check at compile time. And then this, uh, this number uh, type parameter has been abstracted out. So I'll show some examples using both doubles and reals. Um, and then just to remind folks, if you haven't seen this or taken uh, you know, long flights, um, this is an illustration that the, the triangle inequality holds for these coordinates. Um, the, the path uh, on the top is from SFO to the Helsinki airport. And you can see it goes over Greenland. And then the other path is, uh, is San Francisco to Helsinki via Miami. And just sort of visually, it looks like they're about the same. But in fact, the, the lower path is a couple thousand miles longer. Um, and in fact, the Miami to uh, Helsinki is about the same. Um, it's a little bit shorter than SFO to Helsinki. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a there's a, a formula you can you can get uh, just Google for this uh, great circle distance, and it, it it's uh, it, you find it on the internet. Um, some navigation sites ha have have these kinds of things, and it's really just a bunch of trigonometry. And you can see that in this case, um, the distance returned is also an angle. So uh, it, it'll, it'll be in radians, but we can, you can convert it to degrees if that's, if that's more convenient. And then you, there's also a utility function to convert that to a distance by multi multiplying it by the, uh, the Earth's radius, um, if that's what you want, which often is the case. So I wrote this thing up and tried to test it as a metric space. And uh, I, the, the test didn't pass. Uh, symmetry um, didn't hold. And it, uh, Skolacek, as it does, provided a nice counterexample. And it said, yeah, these two, I don't know where these are on the globe, but these two coordinates uh, show that symmetry fails. And I, sure enough, I fired up a REPL, and the distance from one, from the first one to the second one is that number of radians uh, on that line. And then in reverse, it's almost exactly the same number, but it's just a little bit different. It's, it's different enough that the test fails. Uh, that, that turns out to be something like a, a nanometer difference. Uh, so for all practical purposes, this does not matter. But the point is that the tests fail. And it'd be nice to use these axioms uh, and, do, and this property testing methodology and, and have everything work. Um, and you know, this is apart from the fact that, uh, that the Earth is not a perfect sphere anyways. So uh, you've got, uh, the, it's, it's, an, it's a, some sort of an ellipsoid, um, and it's not even really that. And you've got plate tectonics and, and all kinds of stuff going on. And, and, uh, topography of the Earth. Uh, so yeah, the point is not that this is sort of important for any practical purposes, but we want these tests to pass. Um, and uh, so I was trying to figure out how, how to get around this, and I remembered I'd been to a talk in, in Portland, Eric Osheim's talk about uh, Spire and real numbers. 
and I, and I wondered if, if uh, real would do the job. So it was a great uh, slide in that talk where I uh, showed that the, the oil identity uh, works. So e to the i pi plus one is zero. Um, and it's, it's sort of beyond the scope of this talk and beyond my ken to, to explain why that's true, but it does involve Taylor series approximations, if you remember from uh, calculus class. So these, these formulas allow us to get as much precision as we have uh, time to wait. Um, it's an important part of the, of the technique. Um, and so by simply replacing double with real, uh, the test started passing. So you can see I, we get a lot more precision when, when measuring. These are the same two points, one and two. Um, so that you get a lot more precision, but more importantly, they're equal and the tests pass. So uh, a related uh, type class, um, this is one that's in axle, it's a length space. So a metric space tells you about the distance between points, but it doesn't tell you anything about the path. If you want the path, you need to rely on something else. And not to go over all of this, but I think the, the important part here is this little lowercase gamma function. So this gamma can uh, take you know, the, a number from zero to one representing the portion of the way uh, along the path you want to find the point for and will return the point. Um, and so, the implementation looks like this. Again, this was just something I found on some kind of a navigation website uh, that involves a lot of trigonometry. Um, so it takes two points and returns another point, or it takes two points and then a f, which is that number that rep that's uh, between zero and one, and returns the point that, that that's that portion uh, of the distance along the path. And uh, note, we've got a couple different kinds of units here too. Some of these are uh, ununited coefficients, um, others are angles. And then in the end, we, we, uh, we're going to pass along, uh, you know, coming out of the arctangent function, um, uh, these, these angles are measured in radians. So the, the, the coordinates that are returned, if you want to consume them in degrees, you can do that, but that conversion will happen later uh, by the consumer. And here's just a proof that, that it works. Um, we're just gen generating you know, from 0 to 10 um, you know, by, on, by tenths uh, the waypoints along the way. So these are all actually equidistant. Um, but you can see they kind of spread out. And just like the earlier uh, slide, they, they arc over Greenland. And so um, that was just a lot of fun. Uh, and I, this, this Mars Climate Orbiter gets cited a lot by, by the strongly typed camp. Um, and yet, I think a lot of us end up writing web services and ETL processes and that kind of thing. So this was fun just to sort of have a chance to, uh, to, to think about this, this problem. Uh, there's something that's a little closer to this problem. And you can see here, uh, again, just from Wikipedia, that the, the plan trajectory is the white line on top. And because there was a disagreement uh, about whether some uh, quantities were measured in non-SI units or, or, or metric units, um, they got something horribly wrong, and the, and the orbiter smashed into the planet uh, on September 23, 1999. So it's an off-sited example of where um, you, using a, a type system to, to capture the, the constraints around uh, units and conversions uh, can, can be really helpful. Um, just check on time here. OK, so the, the other interesting number type uh, in Spire, there, there's a number of them, but the, the one I'm going to talk about is rational. Um, so uh, oftentimes, the numbers that we're working with really can just be represented as fractions of whole numbers. So here we have a third. Uh, and below, we can see that uh, 50 over 200 is simplified to 1 fourth. So of course, that doesn't come for free, um, but, but I think in many cases, the the, the small performance hit is worth the precision. Um, so just one, one easy example, taking the mean or the harmonic mean of some fractions, um, it's, it's nice to not lose precision in that operation. Harmonic mean is useful when you're averaging uh, rates. I'm going to skip over this one. but um, So this is the type signature of a naive Bayes constructor. You see it's got a lot of type parameters. Um, the point I wanted to make about it was that uh, we evaluate these things, we create performance metrics to evaluate uh, classifiers, and the most common ones are precision and recall, and there's some other ones, specificity, accuracy, F1 score. Um, those are actually just sort of tallies and fractions internally. That's how they're computed. And so it's kind of nice to, to not lose any of the precision there. So recall in this particular case, um, this is a canonical example of predicting whether or not two people go out and play tennis. 
so in this in this case, the predictions were, you, you know, there was 100% recall, uh, meaning that everything that uh, should have been in the query was in the query uh, result set, and uh, and then precision is everything that was in the result set should have been in uh, the result set. So. You could maybe make an argument that when you're displaying this sort of a metric, you might want to convert it to double because they're more easily comparable. Um, just you can visually inspect them. Um, but at least internally, it's nice to represent these things as rationals. Uh, same thing is true for a joint probability table. Again, this is sort of a canonical example um, uh, from sort of Bayesian network literature of uh, five variables. There's an, an earthquake, may or may not happen. A, a burglary may or may not happen, and then there's an alarm which, which may or may not go off, um, and it can even just spontaneously go off. Um, and then there are two people, John and Mary, which uh, may or may not call the police or the, the fire department. Uh, and you can see one of these, this is sort of in, in a lighted ex uh, example here, but the odds are one in uh, 20 billion that both an earthquake and a burglary happen, but the alarm doesn't go off, and yet John and Mary both call the police. So it's pretty outlandish, but it's sort of nice to capture exactly uh, how, you know, how frequently that might happen. And then we, summing out all of the variables from this joint probability table to get one, to get exactly one, is really nice. Um, yeah. Another example of uh, where fractions come in handy is in calculating odds in games. So here I'm calculating the odds of snake eyes. So um, the, this die is basically just a uh, you know, uniform distribution on the numbers from one to six. And I've got this little bit of uh, uh, syntactic sure that make it look like probability notation. So the odds that the first one is one and, and the second one is one, um, it, there's nothing su too sophisticated going on there. But, but it's nice that the answer comes out as 1 36th. I think as a double, that's something like 0 0.0277, et cetera. Uh, it's not something I would recognize. Whereas if we write it as 1 36th, uh, it, it, that's more obviously correct to me. Um, so I think there's even like a, a user interface argument for using fractions uh, and uh, rational numbers. And another dice example is uh, uh, to you know throw two dice, add them, and, and calculate the distribution. So here, like we, we all know, seven is the most common uh, number when you when you total uh, uh, two dice thrown. Um, there's only one way to get two, and there's only one way to get twelve. So you see this nicely formed triangle. The nice thing about computing it with this uh, distribution monad is, is uh, these numbers are precise. We could do 10,000 simu uh, you know, we could simulate 10,000 rolls and get a distribution that looks a lot like this. Uh, but it's nice to have the exact numbers uh, in many situations. So, uh, you know, this is sort of a little more forward-looking uh, with the project. But um, how many people are familiar with the Monty Hall problem? Okay, so I'd say a majority, a solid majority there. Okay, so I won't spend too much time on this, but you know, this, uh, how many people are familiar with this, this sort of scandal around it 25 years ago with the, uh, the parade? Uh, okay, cool. So uh, there, was a, there was a woman who wrote for Parade Magazine. A reader had written in um, a, to ask about the Monty Hall problem. So the, the reader asked, you know, should I change my decision? Uh, you know, I've, I've, and just to recap, uh, there's a car behind one of these doors. The contestant picks one. Monty Hall reveals one of the other doors, and there's a goat behind it, and offers the contestant a chance to switch. Should the contestant switch? The answer is yes, but that's it's really counterintuitive. Um, so explaining this is is notoriously challenging. And this woman from Parade Magazine wrote it up, had the right answer, but these thousands of people wrote in just blasting her, many of them with sexist comments. Um, but in the end, she was vindicated. Uh, it, was a, it was a good story. Um, so I, I wanted to take a crack at this, given what I had done w with Axel. And here's the, the closest I could get, um, which is uh, this outcome function is a function from the probability of switching to, uh, to the uh, distribution of Booleans, which indicate whether or not the car was won. And then I can create a, just a chance of winning, given, a, given that probability, um, as a single number. And then I can make these two assertions. And these assertions pass right now. So I can say that the chance of winning, given that the contestant always switches, is, is 1 half. 
the chance of, of winning, given that the, that the contestant always sticks with the original choice, is one third. So that's probably enough to convince most people um, that, that that's the right strategy, but it's not a proof. And so I think looking forward um, with, with the project, I'd like to, I'd like to spend some time um, generalizing this, making this more declarative, making this less ad hoc, and work for, for general purpose uh, games. And this is particularly interesting because it's unlike chess and checkers, the, there's imperfect information here. So the, the agents have, have different views of, of what reality is. That's what makes it especially hard. Um, and so uh, sort of wrap up with a couple of really dense um, slides. I think one of the ways to go about this um, it can be found in this, this paper that was presented in Popple 2002 by Ramsey and Pfeffer that des described the stochastic lambda calculus and the monads of probability distributions. So this is like a, a way of baking in distributions not only into values but into all the, all the branching logic of, of a program. Um, and I you know, haven't really parsed this uh, and grokked all of this, but it's something I'd like to do uh, in, in the next year. If anybody's interested in collaborating on that, it would be, I'd be very interested to hear about that. Um, and then in that same paper, they, re they present this, this wall of notation, uh, measure terms, which is a, a more efficient way of calculating the same thing. Um, so th this, I, I suspect that a lot of this stuff exists in a, already in a project called Figaro, uh, which was uh, written by, by Avi Pfeffer. Um, uh, want to take a closer look at that, but I think just sort of the, the, the idea of taking Spire's abstractions and number types and bringing them to some of these other algorithms, these other libraries, I think can kind of unlock, um, if nothing else, at least uh, more thorough test coverage. Um, but I also think it's, it's a little bit enlightening to see how the precision of these numbers um, uh, interact with the, the semantics of the, of, the, of the algorithms themselves. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I would love to hear from you if you're all interested in this. I just published a, a new version of this uh, a few nights ago. Uh, it's up on the source codes on GitHub and uh, the artifacts are on Sonotype. Um, and yeah, as, as Alexi mentioned, I'm now uh, heading into a new job in a few weeks as VP of engineering at Ravel. So we'll be hopefully doing a lot of hiring uh, soon. So if, if you're interested in that, let me know. Um, so yeah, thanks. Any, any questions? I don't know if we have much time, but. Yeah. No, no, that was not. They're distributions. Yeah, They're, that's all Axel code. Yeah, yeah. This this does exist in the source code on on GitHub. You can find this example. It runs every time I commit a change. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll turn it over. Cool. Well, thank you.